Hi everyone. Welcome to my studio again. <laughs> Today I'm going to um, do something I've been needing to do for a little while, which is reorganize my props. But the reason I needed to do this was I, I really needed to get in and give my, my shelves and my cupboards a really good spring clean, even though it's not spring here. Um, but as you know, with you know, using a lot of these types of materials, woolen fabrics and things like that, you get a lot of fluff and, um, and dust that accumulates. So this is a really great way to kind of pull everything off the shelves, give them a good clean. I've already wiped mine down with disinfectant and they're nice and clean, ready to start stacking everything on the shelves. And I'm gonna show you how I do that using different colors and, and sort of giving you a few tips on how you can display it beautifully so you can create an amazing first impression for your clients when they do walk into your studio because that's what it's all about. Those first impressions really do count and are very, very valuable to you um, in terms of that customer relationship and how you progress from that very first point of contact right through to the delivery of somebody's products. So yeah, let me know where you're watching from. We've got someone from California on. Good morning, everyone, and good evening. <laughs> The good morning, Kelly, is Susan Sawyer. Hi, Mum. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to have a little bit of fun today. Do you know what else I want you to do? If you have any questions whatsoever, I want you to pop them into the comments. Because this is going to be me stacking shelves, literally, um, I am here to, to answer any questions that you might have. So it doesn't have to be about props or anything like that. If you've got a question, a concern about anything that's going on right now, or you know anything that happens in the in the studio right here that I can help you with please fire away I'm here to give you as much as I possibly can for the next next little while while we're live but again if you can't watch the entire live um, session that we're doing this morning it will stay in the group so you can come back and watch it later we have been going live every day here in the group well not every day except for Saturdays and Sundays um, but we've been going live every day since the 17th of March. So we've created a lot of content. You may have noticed yesterday I shared the third interactive PDF. Michelle has created these amazing PDFs. You'll find them in the files section of the group if you didn't see my post. It's also under the announcements tab, which you'll find. But the PDFs are basically created after a week of the lives and they give you links it's interactive so every little box that you see on the pdf you can click on it's going to take you to an amazing resource something that can give you a little bit of motivation something can give you some advice some free tips and things to use within your studio and your business or just to help you stay you know focused and motivated and 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 get you through this tough time that we're all experiencing right now so check out that interactive PDF. It was also sent out in the email yesterday, Monday's email. So if you didn't receive it, please check your junk folder. If you have a Gmail account, make sure you go to the promotions tab and have a look there for it. Often our, um, our emails get a little caught up there. But um, those emails that we send out every week are designed to give you information. Uh, yes, we do promote products like every other business. That's what email marketing is all about. So if you'd seen one of my previous um, videos on marketing, you'll hear me talk about that on, a, on a, an important scale. But also we've got someone from Dubai, Tasmania, United States. Welcome, Ontario, fantastic. We've this got... is so much better than Tiger King. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I haven't yet watched it and I, I'm, I don't want to. Every time we go to Netflix of a night time, my husband goes, should we? And we're like, I'm like, I just don't know if I can do it. <laughs> I've seen the preview, that's for sure. All right, we so got a question. Casey has a question. She wants to know, how many props do you generally keep in the studio at a time? I have a small home studio and don't want uh, and don't have much space and I hate using the same props over and over. Do you know, that is such a good question because as you can see, I've got a lot of things sitting out here on the tables and as I was pulling them out to, to go back over everything that I'm gonna put back onto the shelves, I'm like, I haven't used that in a while, I haven't used this probably ever in the studio. So I'm kind of thinking, what do I put back on my shelves 
to make it look amazing, to help it make, make it look amazing, sorry, but also in terms of ease, in terms of, you know, accessibility throughout a session and and what, you know, you don't want to create too much clutter and if you don't have enough space, I suggest, you know, finding another area that you can store those things that you don't really feel, you know, that you want to use right now. But for me, when I'm choosing the props that I want to stay in my studio and on my shelves, it basically all comes down to versatility. So how much variety can I get from one prop? Also, um, my favourites tend to kind of go with my current style of shooting at the moment and you'll notice as you grow throughout your career as a photographer your style will slightly change so the way that I photographed today is very different to the way that I photographed 10 years ago and even five years ago so it's constantly changing and I'm always experimenting with different colours, textures, things like that but I do have my faithfuls that I continually come back to which leads me to um, a question that when I when I shared earlier about an hour ago and I said that we were going to um, go live here today doing this someone asked a comment on that post and it was what are the essentials when you are starting out and I've actually got um, two pieces here on this table that I have had my entire time I've been photographing babies for about 15 years now so the, um, the one thing I did actually start with was an old bean bag, a teardrop bean bag. And I literally, you know, with the, the pointy end, I tied a knot and I turned it upside down. And that's what I used to photograph babies on. So I just used some old blankets from around the house, some old sort of cot, cot dooners to make it nice and thick. But yeah, I didn't really have a lot and I couldn't afford to buy a lot either. So we were very tight and we went from a two income family down to a one income family when I first started out in photography. So um, I needed to obviously be very careful with what I spent. But I had a piece of black fabric that I purchased. This is the same piece of black fabric I have always used. Probably needs replacing, but I just can't bring myself to get rid of it. But I just bought this um, from like a, well, we call it Spotlight, but it's like a, a fabric supplier and it has never been hemmed or anything like that, but it's a stretchy piece of sort of lycra material. It is not shiny. It's got a matte finish to it. So that means that when I'm photographing it, it photographs beautifully. I can do a lot of my, you know, in parent hands photos with this and some beautiful black and white moody photos. But I have, I used to use that as my background. So I would take my, my little backdrop, backdrop stand and I would hook that up and I'd photograph all my parent shots on a black background because I found that so much easier. And the photos were always very timeless when I did that as well. The other item that I have still which didn't cost me a cent and I still use it a lot in my studio is an old bucket I found on the side of the road. Um, we do here in Australia, I'm not quite sure what you call it where you are from, but we call it curbside pickup. So you just basically put all of your, you know, your things that you don't want, household, household items, large items on the side of the street and they come along and collect them. So I found this on the road and I have been using this, I can tell you, for about 15 years now and um, it's one of my favourite pieces. But all of my other pieces, they've been collected over a period of time. And I do have some more bits and pieces, but again, I don't use them. I do have some sentimental attachments to a few of my other pieces that I can't quite get rid of. But I recommend don't get rid of them completely. Just find somewhere that you can store them. And then that way, when you are ready to use them, you can reintroduce them back into your space when you are ready to. And that way you can always give your, um, you know, your photos a, a new sort of look and, and feel uh, every now and then and push your creativity as to what you can create with different items as well. Um, we've got a question from Deborah. Hi Kelly, thank you for your unselfless giving. My question is, when you do sitters or family sessions, do you have offer? Um, do you offer different products and prices? Uh, no. So I basically have a, a set session fee, and I offer twenty images for every session that I do. I do have some mini sessions. Sorry, I do. My sitter sessions are very short, so they come with a ten image gallery that that they can choose the same products that I currently sell. And with my family sessions, 
Um, it depends. I will give them the option of whether or not they want a shorter session or a longer session. Um, but the session fee does stay the same. The only thing that will change will be the package that they purchase from that. So yeah, I tend to keep everything very simple um, and streamlined. But the reason my sitter sessions are shorter is because babies at that age, their attention span is a lot shorter and they don't want to be um, you know, moved around and picked up, put down continuously. Plus, you know what, when I'm creating a gallery of photographs, I wanna create very unique and different photographs for that um, person, that client. I don't wanna give them 20 images and a lot of them look the same. And there's not a lot you can do with a sitter baby. They sit or they lay down on their tummy or their back. So I'm gonna get as much variety in those sort of different positions as I can and then get a couple of parent shots with them as well. So that way I'm creating, you know, beautiful timeless images. They're all completely different. So I'm guaranteed to sell all of them because they can't, if they can't, you know, they can't decide because they're all different. They're all unique. They, uh, they tend to want all of them. But when we're supplying our clients with uh, galleries with a lot of images that look similar, you are going to create confusion with them and it's going to be very hard for them to decide on which photos to choose. And I can tell you from experience that's always resulted in a much lower sale. So for me, it is always about creating variety and, um, and so forth. But when it comes to props and sitters and things like that, I do have to have, you know, a certain amount of props available for that, not just newborn. So I've got, you know, larger beds, I've got larger bowls that they can sit in, but I am also being very, very conscious of the fact that whatever they are sitting in, it's going to be safe, it's going to be stable, and they can't injure themselves on that at all. And we always use spotters too. So yeah. Uh, Trisha's got a question. What size do you suggest for wraps and backdrops? Uh, material backdrops better. I struggle if I should work with printed backdrops more often. So do you know, I've got a variety of different backdrops. I use canvas backdrops, I use painted walls, I use V-flats, I use you know beautiful printed materials as well. I suppose with each backdrop, you just have to be careful um, in terms of what it is that you are photographing. If you're photographing a baby that's just started crawling on a material background, then that material is going to kind of get caught up and it's going to create a lot of wrinkles and, and creases and things like that. So I tend to use my canvases or my beautiful big floor, fake um, wooden floors, mats from Intuition Backgrounds by Becky Gregory. So for me, my preference is canvas because it's a lot sturdier and it's great to photograph on in terms of reflections and um, it doesn't crease, it doesn't uh, get caught up um, in terms of those softer materials, yeah. Right. While you're kind of going through some of the questions there, what I'm going to talk through is you can see I've kind of got my natural yellow brown tones up this end and then I've got some sort of more grey purpley um, muted sort of tones down here. So when it comes to popping them onto my shelves, I want to make it look nice and, and sort of homely. I want that first impression for people to walk in to go, oh wow, like it looks like a homeware store. And that's what it's all about because I use everything here that's sitting on my table right now on a regular basis. Um, I don't so much use this yellow bowl, but what I'm gonna do is keep that because it is a little bright, it is a little different. If someone comes in and they love yellow, we'll use it. But I, I wanna use that here because it's gonna tie off really well with a few other tones that I've got in my blankets and wraps and it will hold my dried flowers and it will look really pretty on the shelf. So even though with that question before, you know, what to keep in your studio, what not to keep, I still wanna keep some things there that are gonna, you know, sort of tie in all of the different tones and textures together to style it in such a way that it does look like a display in a homeware store. So um, I'm gonna use props that I might not necessarily photograph babies or sitters in to hold different things like flowers that I would more likely use um, to help decorate other props, if that makes sense. Nice, um, Nancy's got a question. If you do a white paper backdrop for sitters, how do you get the white to look white? Well, that's all about exposure. 
So that's understanding your, how your camera captures the information that you are photographing. And when you get that exposure right, your whites should be white, not gray and flat. Usually when you have a problem with white tones, it can often be because the image is underexposed or it can be that there are different color casts, you haven't got your white balance right, things like that. I go, over, I go over all of that in terms of getting your exposure right in my tutorials, which is called Getting It Right in Camera. But understanding your histogram and where white information should sit within that histogram is going to really benefit you when you are photographing white. But you also need to make sure that you light that white background properly so that you get a beautiful, even light across that white. So, and, it, and it's, it's, it depends as well on whether or not you are backlighting, so you want to really blow that white out, or whether or not you are just photographing on a beautiful white background and how you can retain all the information and the detail in those white highlights so that you're not overexposing it so you still print detail, um, but also making it nice and sort of creamy and not dull and flat and gray. All right, so I'm gonna start working down this end and I've left some of my bigger props up there because um, they're just a little bit heavier. I've got some weights in them and things like that, but they're basically there for um, a little bit of texture and things like that. So yeah, I might not necessarily use this prop up here. Hang on, I didn't want to get this down, but I will. <laughs> Careful. They are heavy. So this one here I'm gonna take out and we'll pop that back up there because I definitely don't use this and so I can use it to put some flowers and things like that in. So I'm just gonna pop it off to the side and that way I might be able to um, use it a little later. But when it comes to filling my shelves, I'm always gonna start with my largest items first. So I used to do um, shelf display when I worked in retail for a really large retail company and I used to do all of their window displays and in-store displays and it was probably one of my favorite jobs before I became a photographer because it just allowed me to kind of get lost in you know this beautiful sort of um, I don't know this world of styling of different textures and colors and how they all worked really well together and I learned a lot on the job doing that. Um, Casey says that you've inspired her to photograph her posing table backdrops uh, with coordinated wraps for content. Ah, so beautiful. being able to go through, organise your, your wraps and, and blankets yeah. and that sort of thing into different colour coordinators to be able to post it on social media. That Absolutely. Sort of and do you know what? Like my wraps at the moment, I probably need a bit of system because they're starting to overflow my ladders there but yeah when it comes to my my blankets I like to have you know a lot of different variety but you'll notice that I've really all of the colors are different I don't I've seen some studios where literally they could have four times the amount of blankets that are hanging up there but a lot of it's very similar so for me it comes back to that whole you know that you know offering sort of less I suppose so I, I choose the very select colors that I want to work with and what I know clients will choose regularly but there's not a lot of the same if that makes sense because it becomes too overwhelming when it come when it's time to choose what color you want to use so I want to limit the choice even though it looks like there's a lot there but it is a great variety of colors and there's not a lot that are the same oh, cool. okay so I'm gonna start with my large props here. And what I'm gonna do is, because my shelves kind of, you know, come down and they're all sort of evenly spaced, down the bottom I've got my baskets with my hats in it, my, my boy ones and my girl ones. And if you saw yesterday, I started to get a little creative with how I'm going to eventually display those. And what I'm gonna do with my hats is I'm actually gonna hang them on the end of this cupboard here. So they'll be on display on the outside. I've just got to, dedicate some more time to getting that finished. All right, but what you can see here is I've got bays. I've got one, two, three, four. And so I'm gonna break them up and then I'm gonna gradually move and change the colors as we work, work our way down through each bay. So up here, I'm gonna work with my browns and more goldy warm tones. And then I'm gonna come across and I'm gonna move into some more neutral tones, you know, as that sort of, um, I suppose transitions in color, then to some more sort of gray tones and then into my more pastely muted sort of purple and um, 
uh, I suppose it's like a jadey green colour. So down there. So it's going to be a bit of a transition from one tone to the next. But as I place my large props here, what I'm going to do is go, I'm going to go large prop and then come on the diagonal and come back down to another large prop. And then I'm going to balance it out here with another large prop here. So I'm getting that balance from large to small throughout the shelves. So it's got an, an overall sort of um, balanced feel to it, I suppose. It's almost like creating composition within my shelves. <laughs> Uh, Shaquille has got a question. For beginner newborn photographers, what lens do you suggest for a crop sensor body? Oh, tricky. Yeah, it is. Do you know, um, I think with crop sensors, depending on the camera that you are using, and I'm, I'm not 100% sure, it is always going to create a bit of a problem when it comes to lenses. So that's why a full frame body is going to be best. So I would probably have... Do you know what I'm going to recommend? Go and go to YouTube and type in Kelly Brown lens video. You're going to come up with a video there and it goes for about an hour. So I'd make yourself a cup of tea, but watch that because it goes through all the different types of lenses and what lens is better suited to which um, genre of photography, but also what happens when you are working with a, a crop sensor. And it's nice. going to give you a much better explanation than what I can give you here now because I'm focused on something a little, probably a little different. All right. I do love all these questions coming through though. And you know what? I think I'm going to go green down here into those greys. And this is something my mum loves to do. So that's why she's watching there. <laughs> I reckon that'll look good there. So what I'm going to do is place these ones here inside each other because they're very similar. And the props that I use probably more frequently are the ones that I'm going to want to be able to access um, quite quickly. So I'm going to start sort of dispersing these around. And I've gone, um, you know, sort of square then to round. And up here, I'm going to go round to square and see how that works for us. I might actually put that there. Got any more questions? Oh, we've got Bacola watching live from Nigeria. Oh, hi. Uh, what, what length are your prop posing beds? Uh, as in my posing bag? Um, I think oh, the little beds? About, like your okay. little green bed even, or your brown bed. All right, bed. so this one here. Actually, do you know what? I've got a ruler. Give me two seconds, I'll grab my ruler. Okay. One moment, please. I should have bought some on hold music or something. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, so this little one here on the inside is about 46 and a half centimetres. Um, when it comes to choosing the right sort of to sized beds and things like that, like this little one here is quite, quite short compared to this one. So when you're positioning a baby in there, they're going to have to be more upright. So you're going to have to put them down on a bit more of, an, of a diagonal. So bum down nice and deep and head up nice and high for that particular one to get most babies to fit. And um, with something like this, I know I can wrap a baby up, place them down on their back. This one here, this one's um, a lot larger, so I, it's much easier to sit a sitter in this one and, uh, and so forth, but also twins as well. Nice, thank you. That one there is probably a little too small to put, put twins in. But yeah, it's one of my favorite, favorite props. And Trisha's got a question about bean bags. Um, there's all different types out there. She has a large bean bag, but only a small space. What are your thoughts on a table with a lot of blankets on it versus a bean bag? The thing with 
opposing babies is the, the safety aspects. You've got to be so careful when it comes to putting them on top of any surface. And even though you might think it's safe and you understand what it is you're doing, think of it from the perspective of the parents. So when they come in and they see you put a baby down on a, on a surface possibly this high, and if you perhaps move or turn, you know that the baby's not necessarily going to go anywhere but a parent might not. And you know what, they see the photographs, they don't understand how they're created. So you've got to put yourself in their shoes. How would you feel, you know, if that was your baby and you'd never experienced a setup like that? So the thing is, you've got to make sure, obviously, whatever you are putting a baby on, it is sturdy, it is stable, and the right supports are in place for that baby to not be able to go or move anywhere and you should always be within an arm's, arm's reach of that baby. Even when you come back to take that shot, and I know a lot of people use a wide angle lens for that reason, I use a 24 to 70 and I will shoot my entire session at a 70 mil photo, focal length, and I'm still only an arm's length away. And I don't have overly long arms, like I am tall, but do you know, it's all about just having that little bit of sort of common sense when it comes to you know, the, the safety and the structure and prevention is always better than cure when it comes to, you know, any type of surface that you put a baby on. But in the other hand, you've got to put yourself in your client's shoes. How are you going to make them feel if they see their baby on something that might not look stable or sturdy? So without seeing the bed, it's very hard to obviously comment on that. But for me, it just has to be 100% solid and sturdy and safe to put a baby on. And that's why I've always gone with a bean bag because it's connected to the ground. My bean bag's got a frame around it. And before I had the particular style that I'm using right now, I had like a bean bag that was 30 centimeters high. So that's one foot. So that high off the ground. So nice and low. It was a meter wide. So a little bit bigger than this in diameter. And I would sit really low to the ground working with someone's baby and I had my backdrop stand behind it. So in terms of safety, it was always going to be very safe. There's always been a big well in the middle of my bag as well so that um, I don't overfill my posing bag so that the baby obviously feels nice and supported. It's not going to roll anywhere. It's not going anywhere. It's not gonna roll off a hard surface. So in terms of providing that safe environment, but also, you know, making a baby look comfortable and content and secure is going to help your clients feel more confident in you when you are taking and handling their baby. Because we have to remember that it's the first time that they are seeing someone, a complete stranger, hold their baby for the first time. Apart from obviously staff in the hospital, but they are medical professionals that they trust already because of the jobs that they are hired to do. So there's a lot of stuff for you to consider. Alrighty. I <laughs> I am looking at this going, what can I change here? And do you know what? I am going to change something up here. I'm going to pull this out for a minute because I have got another crate here with some plants in it. Not well, they're not plants, but they're dried. They're not even dried, they're fake, fake plants. And I'm going to pop this in here. Uh, Kelly, Heather's got a question about prop vendors. Do you have any favorites? Do you know, I have a few prop vendors that I do prefer to get my, my materials and fabrics and things like that from. Um, but when it comes to props, I tend to buy most of mine from antique stores and things like that because I like different. I like using something that nobody else has and I like buying things and investing in things that I personally love. So um, I have, in terms of my materials and fabrics, when it comes to buying certain things, I'll come down here, I've got some of my preferred wools and layering blankets. Now these are from Coochie Koo. She is my, my favorite wool supplier. Um, and, you know, beautiful Holly, they actually raise all of their own sheep that they make all of this from. And that's what I love so much about it. And she just, everything that 
is um, that that I get is you know handmade by her and it's beautiful. The quality is always amazing. Now it is spelt a little differently. It's spelt C W T C H I, and then Ku C W O. So I get all my wools. Now I get all my knit things. I love my knitted hats and things like that from my mum Sue, who's watching. Hi mum. Um, so she sews little pieces. And then a lot of my wraps, these ones, these are from Freebird. So I prefer, um, you know, the quality of her wraps, the materials. They are nice and soft, super long and stretchy. And she's always got great variety as well. So in terms of when I'm looking for things like that, that's the, they're my go-tos. But there are so many prop vendors out there. There's too many for me to list that I've also got many things from. And they create amazing props. So I'm always going to support the vendors that are in our business because you know that's their livelihood as well and they they all create different and unique things um so yeah it's um it's one of those things it's finding people that you know feel the same way you do about the industry and make something that you love and sticking with them as well all righty so i've kind of changed things up there a little bit and what i might do is move this one down here for a second and this is the thing you might play like this in your studio for a little while until you get it just right I wonder if that'll go in there Kelly, Susie's got a question. Um, do you consult ahead of the session for parents to choose props and poses, or do you mainly figure it out on the day? So I do it all on the day, purely because, I, well, I tell my clients to go through my Instagram, go through my website, my Facebook page, and if there's anything on there that they love, to take screenshots of it and bring it with them. Um, and we always find that a lot of fun. But I also know that when they come into my studio, they're going to see something that they may not have seen online. And they're going to go, oh, I want that. So this is part of the conversation that we have at the beginning of the shoot. I ask them, is there anything that you um, have seen that you love that you would like to create today? Um, are there any particular colors that you would like to use? Have you um, got any preferences when it comes to blah, blah, blah? So I ask as many questions as I possibly can to get the right information because I want to create photographs using the things that they love, using colors that they love, and using all of the little bits and pieces that I start with that I know they're going to love because at the end of the day, people will be polite. They will keep their mouths closed. And if you are using a something busy like a headband or a hat or you know styling it with something that they're sort of sitting back and going what is she doing why is she using that hat that headband they're not going to say something so for me you know it'll be something simple like you know with this particular setup I th I think either of these would look amazing do you have a preference and then I ask them for their input so I will choose, like they'll choose the colour, I'll grab all the bits and pieces that I think will look nice and then I'll ask them for additional input because then that gives them the opportunity to say, well, actually I'd prefer I didn't, if, if you know, we didn't use a hat or, oh, I like that one. And then you're going to learn a little bit more about what their particular taste is because we all have different taste. You know, we all wear different clothes, we all style ourselves differently. And so you've got to start to identify your clients and, and then ask them all of the right questions. And how many times do you use a prop before retiring it? Oh, well, Never. I mean, I've still got my bucket. <laughs> and a lot of these pieces that I've got, like this bowl here and this bowl here, they were quite large investments for me, but they are my preferred go-to because they're very unique and they're very timeless and a lot of people will see them and come to me for them but they're also very versatile as well so i can put the baby upright in there i can use twins with this one i can also put the babies on their sides in both of them and then on their tummies in both of them or on their backs it's it's all about using props and styling them with the different textures and colors so it's not so much about all of this stuff but when it comes to my blankets, the minute that they start to create sort of this pilled look, you can see 
it's sort of starting to, to fray a little bit there and you get the little, the little balls and things on them from overwashing them, that blanket needs retiring. Um, but these are also great just to have in the studio to help fill props if you need them. So I don't mind keeping things like that because um, they, they also work really well at lining props too. So I don't mind um, using them in that sense. All right. So I'm actually going to continue to play here a little bit more because I know that I can free up a bit more space here by stacking some of these inside. A lot of them are already pre-lined, my larger props. They've already got all of the towels and things in them. Now I don't use this one as much, so I'm okay at putting it up here, but it is going to look really great having that that tone, that colour there. There we go. And I want to put my little bed down here so that I can stack some materials on top of it, which I think is going to look really great. And then... that in there. Um, Naisha's got a question. Is there a certain size bowl that you go for? What's your rule? Um, as long as I can fit my arm from my elbow to my hand inside the prop, that's usually going to be a great place to start. Actually, I'm going to use that with my greys. And then this one here I don't tend to use so much so I'm probably going to pop it away because of the surface on the inside it's quite sort of shiny so when I do put um, anything in it to line it I, it tends to move there's no grip I could get some um, oh you can you can buy them to go in your shelves and under rugs it's like a rubber kind of mat so I just need to buy some of that from Ikea next time I'm there to pop in the bottom of things like that which is going to stop any materials moving in there but in the, the, for the time being I'm not going to pop that on my shelf because it's not something that I, I actually use on a regular basis. Alright so with where how I've kind of got a few of these things sort of set up here I know that I can um, create you know a little bit more sort of space and variety here but what I'm going to do is, before I start popping in my colours, I'm going to continue to work my way around and get those props exactly where I want them. And I am actually going to change this up here. And I'm going to pop this one in here. Is it going to fit? No. just that back corner where it's a bit busted <laughs> and I might even pop that up there. Kelly, Mandy's got a question um, about poorly or grumpy or colicky babies. Oh yeah. Um, how do you manage them? Would you stop the session or do you just continue on? What, what's the, what's the rule? Not going to fit, no. Um, so when it comes to working with babies who are a little more colicky, a little bit more fussy, whingy, things like that, um, it's, there's a reason why they are feeling that way. So I basically go through the process of elimination and I start to kind of figure out like, what can I do to help this baby feel more comfortable? Do I need to wrap them, make them feel more secure? Um, do I need to elevate them so that if they have got any form of wind or reflux, that's going to help, things like that. And if you get to a point where a baby is beyond consoling, you know, maybe they're just overstimulated. There's so much involved with creating, you know, the perfect workflow in terms of how your sessions will go and how you, um, I suppose, create that calm environment as well. But yeah, it, it's not just one thing to look for. It's, it's a combination of a lot of things to get you through a session, but it's identifying some of the movements, some of the actions and reactions of babies 
to be able to um, you know know what to do next to help calm them and keep them content but yeah there is a blog post about um, newborn behavior and things like that jump onto the newborn posing blog uh, you'll find some amazing information there on how you can help settle them I'm just looking at where I'm going to put some of this stuff I always like to put it in differently to how I had it before as well. So, Bacola's got a question here for you. It's about when you started out. Did you start out with babies or did you start out in another field and how long have you been doing it? Who are you and what do you do, Kelly Brown? <laughs> I added you. that bit on the answer. <laughs> I thought you might have. Um, do you know, when I first started out, I just photographed anything and everything when I was studying. Um, when I and then eventually, you know, I got asked to do a couple of weddings and I enjoyed doing those. I spent probably three years doing weddings and family portraits. I did a lot of commercial work for different companies. I worked for an architectural company that designed amazing staircases and I would go off every week to photograph beautiful staircases in amazing locations. Um, sounds really weird, but I absolutely loved it. And um, yeah, I had a lot of fun during that process and that time. So for me, it was, I suppose, all of that variety that led me to, um, you know, I suppose where I am today and, and it gives me flexibility too. So a lot of people know me as just a baby photographer, but a lot of my personal work and other projects that I do don't always involve babies. So it's about, I suppose, focusing on what you love to do and I decided long ago um, that weddings and family portraits weren't really my thing. I didn't enjoy them as much as I enjoyed photographing babies. And it didn't take long for me to kind of follow that passion and focus my main business around it. And it was kind of funny at the time because I, I worked for another photographer for a short period of time. And when I left working there, uh, he said to me, you know, babies are just a fad. You won't last in this industry. And, um, and I said, okay, right. I went home, I was feeling a little deflated and then I made the decision and when I talked to my husband about it, he's like, oh, are you sure? He said, are you sure you really want to give up, you know? There's, um, and, you know, I think because babies weren't such a big thing back then, they weren't, you know, commonly photographed like they are today and it was, I suppose it was a big risk that I'm glad I took, but I followed that passion and I was determined to prove some of those people wrong. And now it's kind of interesting because the entire photography industry has accepted baby photography and appreciates how, how difficult it really is because it's not that we just pick up a camera and have to know how that camera works inside and out. We've also got to know how to photograph a baby in terms of how to pose them, how to keep them safe, how to keep them comfortable, how to style, how to decorate, how to, you know, um, look for different camera angles with a subject that's laying horizontal, you know, the majority of the time. And so I think we have come a long way with the baby genre and, you know, I couldn't be prouder than I am right now, especially with this particular group because we have 29 and a half thousand people in here and that just blows my mind at how big this genre has come and that photographer that I worked for all those years ago when he said that I wouldn't last and baby photography was a fad, you know, he went bankrupt because of that mentality and I think we just have to keep that, that focus on what, what is achievable, what can I do instead of what can't I do and focus on what, what it is that you truly want to do because when you love doing something so much, when you are passionate about something like I am with photographing babies, do you know what? I will do whatever it takes to succeed at it because I love it that much. So when you find what it is that you love, 
you know, nothing should be able to stop you. There should be no excuses as to reaching your goals. You will find a way to get there. Sometimes a little slower at your own pace, but that's okay because we all have different things that are gonna impact our lives to prevent us from moving at the same pace as somebody else. So you just have to be patient with yourselves and follow your passion. Do what it is that you love and you will definitely see great, great reward there. Oh, I've got another basket there. I'm thinking, oh, I've got to fill up the space here somehow, but I've got one more here. Now, I just had a question and I lost it. Where did it go? I can remember it. You guys getting bored watching no, me? No, there's lots of questions coming through. Don't worry. Don't oh, good. Worry. Um, do you change your props around to refresh your storage area regularly? That's from Jade Ab Reed. Absolutely, Jade. And you know what? This just gets me more inspired every time I do it with what I'm going to use in my sessions. Um, and that's the thing, like we can get a little caught up in using the same things and we can forget that we've got other things. So I always find when I pull my props out, when I go through them, it gives me just that little bit more energy and, um, and excitement to continually change the way I, I use my props and, um, and what I can create with them. And Sam oh, Carter's got a question. Where do you keep all your baby outfits? Oh, I don't know if you can see. Can you see? So down here I've got all my little pillows and my little small knit blankets. And then this drawer here has got all my girl outfits and all my little boy outfits. And then my messy headband tray that we're going to fix when I finish crafting my... Um, <laughs> my things but yeah they're easy to access and then obviously my wraps and so I work in this area as well and what I do when I get my baby we've decided on the color they're feeding their baby I will grab all the different things that are that are going to go with that tone that color all the different textures that, are, that I could possibly use and I'll pop them in my trolley so that they're at an arm's reach and I don't have to leave the baby um, unattended you're probably thinking where is she going to put that green thing and I'm still guessing myself. Uh -huh. And Casey asks, do you prefer dried flowers or artificial? Oh, it depends. I love my dried flowers. Um, but if you, you can find some beautiful um, artificial flowers, they just sometimes some look a little faker than others. So you've got to be careful with the, the ones that you are, are going to use. Pop that down here for a minute. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. So I haven't used this in a long time, so I'm probably going to find another home for that. And pop these up here. bucket and this is definitely too small to put a baby in but I would have used that recently for something else somebody just asked what was that cylinder with no bottom oh this thing here um yes that was yeah that would be about so right. it's like an old <laughs> I'm guessing like an old um I don't know. Is it like a rice strainer or something? Yeah. Like a, like a it, steamer? Yeah. Um, it is like an old steamer. It's funny, but the first thing that it reminds me of is, you know, when you're panning for gold. Oh, yes. <laughs> but it is, no, it's more of the food type. <laughs> but it's always reminded me of, you know, panning for gold and things like that. But I found that in a secondhand store. Alrighty. So I'm getting rid of things I don't need, which is fantastic. And it's starting to look very pretty. So when I'm putting my blankets in, I mean, and I could put this here just for a bit of color and we could pop some flowers in it. We'll see how we go. Alrighty, so I've got a few different colors here and I'm gonna take all the warm ones 
some greens. They might not necessarily go, but I'm going to take all these warm ones down here. And I'll start layering them because then I can come in and grab them when I need to. And Kelly, how often do you buy props? Not very often. <laughs> she doesn't like to spend money much. <laughs> no, I am definitely um, very good with money. I don't tend to overspend. Um, I do like to, to save money, make money, not spend money. But that's why I'm in business. So I actually allocate a budget um, every month for buying props. And whether or not I use it, it doesn't, you know, it's, I don't always, I don't always spend my, my allocated funds. And Sam Carter would like to know, where did you get the actual storage unit from? Oh, Ikea. And some tips. Um, so Julie obviously has a really small space. Any tips for storage in a small space? I believe you have some experience. <laughs> I do. I had a really small space. My studio literally used to be this big. And um, I basically had, I, I stacked my props in a way so that obviously, you know, the, the smaller items went in the larger items. And I had just some shelves, but I didn't have a lot of equipment then either. So I basically kept everything quite sort of um, simple. I then started to expand out into my hallway, which impacted my family. And it was at that point in time that my husband and I decided that I needed a bigger space. Uh, he did tell me I needed to stop buying props, but um, I knew that that wasn't going to obviously happen over the next however many years. And then it was, um, yeah, then that I decided that I needed a bigger space and I moved into um, our old garage. So Trish has got another question here. It's quite lengthy, but um, I know you said you have your clients go through your IG, etc. cetera. Um, so obviously before they come in, you know, to choose if they like anything. Do you have them also choose the props too, or do you have set ideas on which props? Now, this is all leading to her having a particular prop that she loves that no one else does. <laughs> um, so she's got a bunk bed. Um, ah. But I've never used it as clients aren't really into it, but I love it. What well, does that mean? What should she do? Okay, so it's just personal preference. We've got to remember, you know, <laughs> I, I have a kind of the opposite story. I used to give my baskets to my clients and say, here, have a look through. And if there's anything in there you like, pull it out. We'll use it throughout the session. And there was always a couple of bonnets and hats in there that I would just be kind of sitting there going, please don't pick it, please don't pick it, please don't pick it. And they would pick it. And then I was like, oh, well, I'm now going to use it. Yay. Um, I didn't have the heart to remove them because I'd been given them as gifts by, um, by, by someone. And in the end, you know what, I thought, if I don't want to use it, if that's not how I want my work to look, I just need to remove it. So I suppose when you've got a favourite item, and I've got many that, I do, that don't get picked very often, um, I suppose you probably just need to start photographing it in a way. And if you watched my live, I think it was at the beginning of last week, maybe, oh, I can't remember which, what day it was. But anyway, what I did was I went through social media content and how to create different pieces. You'll find it um, under the announcements tab and in the videos section of the group. But I basically went through and I shared all the different things that you can share on social media in terms of content. And one of them was photographing your props, photographing them in a way that shows people what's possible. So it might just be that your particular clients can't look at it and visually see how you might put a baby in it or what you would do with it. And that's the thing, they see our photos but they don't know how they're created. For me, when my clients come in, they sit down, I've got two albums, because they sell two different types of albums, and inside those albums are photographs with all of my props being used. Because 
Um, I've, they know on my posing bag they've seen all those photos. They're very simple. There's not a lot involved except for basically a blanket and maybe a hat and a headband or a wrap. But when it comes to props, they would look at it and go, oh, not really sure how you would put a baby into that. So it's easy for me to show them an album and also get some touching and feeling my products, which is what I want. Um, but it shows them what the possibilities are. So maybe you just need to show them what, what is possible with that favorite prop of yours. Style it in a way, you don't need to put a baby in it, um, but style it in a way and photograph it like you would have a baby in it. How you visually see it and share it with your clients and put it on your social media page and say, I can't wait to photograph a baby in my, you know, this is my favorite prop, blah, blah, blah. Talk to people about what it is that you want to create and, um, and show them. All right, so this is not going down this end because obviously the colors aren't right. So I'm gonna move this out and bring these down here to tie it all in up here. So, and you know what? I might even pop them up in here. going to make it easy for me to access them and they're not going to get sort of bumped when I'm getting other things out but these flowers here are probably going to look better down this end Uh, Susie has a question about your fluffy blankets. How do you clean them without ruining them? <laughs> this is fun. Um, do you know, I've got a lot of smaller ones. The really large flaccardis, they are very, very hard to keep clean um, and manage and being able to keep them not looking nice and soft as well. So I tend to buy the smaller size and um, they are easy to pop into your washing machine. But another way, if you can't put them into your washing machine is pop them into your bathtub with wool wash, give them a really good hand wash and then dry them obviously out in the sun on your clothesline, things like that. But a wire dog brush helps when they're dry to um, make them nice and fluffy again. And if anyone has missed the beginning of this video, it will stay in the group so you can go back and re-watch it when it finishes. And oh, your furs, what size? Uh, which ones? My Flacardi ones? Flacardis, yeah. Um, they're just the small size. They come in small, medium and large when you buy them. I don't have many actually. I've got um, my Flacardis. I've got a dark brown, a sort of camel-y colour, like a caramel camel colour. And then I've got my cream. The rest are more sort of mats and rugs. So for example, this is just one I found at Kmart. Um, it's a nice sort of fur, it's got a great texture to it. Goes with a lot of the other colours that I've got. And yeah, the rest are all sort of the same, just bits of furs and things like that that I've found in different, um, different places. But they're not very big, but yeah, they're all small enough to go in my washing machine. But my big cream one, that tends to, that one there, it's probably a medium size in terms of when you're buying a Flacati, small, medium or large. That's the medium and, I, and if I do wash that, um, that goes into the bathtub. All right. So I did have this kind of sitting here to use, but I might end up having to putting, might end up having to put that somewhere else. Um, we will see. Uh, Jen has a question. Any idea how to store flowers? Mine currently look like Kelly's bonnets did earlier. <laughs> uh, like this? <laughs> um, yeah, and, I, and these, it's, you've got to be careful with your flowers. If you use dried flowers, like a lot of these tend to kind of break off and you don't want them going everywhere. So um, you're putting them into a vase or any kind of stand. And I do have this one over here that I can use to sort of stand some of them up, but you've got to be careful, obviously, that you're not creating a big mess every time you're getting them in and out in the studio. 
So these ones I tend to use quite regularly because they're very soft, quite subtle in the background. sort of upright in there and then they'll look really pretty on display on your shelves and I'll make a mess here just for a second alrighty so it's probably a little boring to kind of sit and watch me play here in the studio. But I thought, you know what, great opportunity for you guys to ask some questions, any questions that you have, get them answered and, um, and share as well any experiences that you might be sort of going through right now. I don't think I need that. <laughs> but yeah, this is the perfect time for you to um, play with a lot of your different props and things like that. To... That one's a bit big. And Nancy wants to know, where do you actually buy your dried flowers from? So, well, I just buy wild, well, these are Australian natives. So I just buy them at the supermarket whenever I sort of see them on sale. Um, some of them have been given to me as gifts and then I just dry them and keep them. Um, so yeah, I don't tend to buy them dried because they are beautiful to photograph as well when they're not dry. So I'll just keep that one down there for now because they're all my sort of yellowy colors and then these are all my sort of nicer lighter colors. can pop these up here. All right. Okay, so I am going to pop some more stuff up here, but it's going through my, my drawers and finding the right stuff to put in there. And then I've got some other little flowers that I tend to use here, which can come in and around this basket here. So if I'm going to go with these sort of purple turns, I've got the darker purple one here on top. If, if I want to go with the pink tones, then I can just pop the purple down here. Um, but yeah, it's sort of up to you, I suppose, how you want to design and, and color code all your different, um, all your different, what do you call them? Furs. I'll pop that um, down there. Going back to clients choosing things and colours and that sort of thing, Diane asks, um, do your clients choose the colours? And if they do, do they choose them before or during the session? Um, during, so we do it all during the session. So when they come in, and this is why we're, we're displaying our props today, because I want them to walk in and have a wow effect and, and get excited about what we are going to create in the session and you know they can't do that online and I always encourage them to get up and go and touch and feel things too I think that's really important just found this nice fur it's gonna help kind of fill up this space up in here Yeah, um, and that conversation helps me learn a little bit more about them as well. And when it's here, I can, if I'm not quite understanding, you know, what it is that they want, then it gives me the option to ask more questions and then to possibly show them what we could create as well. Uh, and Casey asks, how many of each colour wrap or backdrop do you have on hand in case you have multiple shoots in a day and parents want the same thing that you've already used that day? Well, I only do one shoot a day. Smart. <laughs> they can be quite taxing, but also 
I don't want to rush my clients out of here. My, I tell my clients that my sessions go for two to four hours. I price myself so that I only have to do one shoot a day. And I'm usually done in about two, two and a half hours. But if they want to sit and feed their baby, um, they've got plenty of time to do that after the shoot before they leave, if they have somewhere else to be, or you know they've got a bit of a drive before they, they get home. Not quite tall enough. So yeah, I, um, I don't tend to rush them out sometimes as well. We have a bit of a, bit of a chat after the shoot. Um, but I want to make it a very relaxing experience for them so they don't feel like they've, you know, they've got to get out or there's another client waiting you know, behind them. I've got fluff all over my face. <laughs> um, Nathalie asks, do you, have, uh, do you recommend to invest in a practice dog? Um, they have put the brand there. Um, or do you recommend to practice um, to gain confidence? So. Well, the thing is... What's, what's for, your thoughts on practice doll? Okay, so if you are wanting to get a practice doll, my advice is to choose something that you can practice lighting, exposure, camera angles, and wrapping with. So it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be, you know, a beautiful silicon doll like mine. It just has to allow you how to you know, perfect your craft in terms of exposure, um, composition, lighting, and and so forth. The thing with, with dolls is, it's not gonna give you confidence in handling a real baby because they don't react or respond or move like a real baby. They definitely don't cry when, when they're in pain or in a position that's uncomfortable for them. The only way you can get more confident is by experience and you have to be patient when it comes to learning how to work with a real baby if you are not confident already doing that. Uh, for me, I've been surrounded by babies my whole life. Um, so it, didn't, it wasn't hard for me to you know, know how to handle and hold a baby you know, securely. So I suppose that experience just comes with either doing mentoring sessions, one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions, working with another photographer in your area, uh, or potentially, um, you know, doing little model call sessions, portfolio building sessions, where you practice one to two poses in every session. You're not trying to do everything all at once. And we've got a question from Midori, a question from Tokyo, actually. Nice. Um, would you be able to explain how the contract you asked your clients to sign, would you kindly do a live that part of, or for that part of the business sometime in the future, maybe? A live on contracts? Mm, tricky. Well, it could be very tricky, but I may just know the perfect person who might be able to come and do a live sort of Q&A with me into the group to answer people's questions regarding contracts. Hopefully I think that she's online right now watching and she, she can could tell be. Us a yes or a no. Yeah, she could tell me where to go. <laughs> she quite which she's does. done in the past. But um, for me when it comes to contracts and things like that, you know, you do have to be very careful. You've got to make sure that you have got all of the right information in your contract. It has been you know, you've got some advice from a legal professional in terms of that contract because it is a legal document. Buying contracts off the internet um, from someone who is in another country, that contract might not be appropriate for where you live based on the different laws. So um, you do have to get the right legal advice. Now, I am definitely not the right person to give legal advice because that's not something I'm, you know, trained at or have studied, so it's it's not my area of expertise. We don't allow people to share contracts in the group because they are legal documents. My particular contract, you know, we spent a lot of money and it's actually got copyright with the law firm on the bottom of it. So we don't share that with anyone in terms of, you know, providing, providing it for people to copy because that's not right. It's not the way that, um, you know, you need to protect your business. 
So yeah, contracts is a good one. So I think that that is a great idea if um, this particular person is willing to to be a part of that. We may have to bribe her. We may. Look, I'm still going here and finding bits and pieces. People are loving it. I hope so. I hope it's not too boring. No, well, I'll just change views there and you can kind of see it's looking more like a homeware store. It's, um, you know, how everything's displayed. There is no clutter. There's no mess. There's no dust. Like, everything's beautiful and you kind of want to walk up and touch it all so that's what we want we want people to feel like they can walk up and touch everything absolutely Your um, backdrop system that you've got on the ceiling, Kelly, um, Olya has, um, con is considering buying one, um, but only has a very limited space. Now those pipes, how big are they and how does all of that work? Um, what do you mean in terms of how long they are? Yeah. So can, you are can, they adjustable? Well, we had the, these are just aluminium pipes and we literally Googled aluminium distributor um, supplier in Brisbane, which is where we're based. So we went there with, um, we knew that my canvases were three meters wide. So I needed something that was going to be a little longer. So we had them cut specifically. The actual system itself are the brackets and the bits that go in the end. So you can have your, um, you know, your poles that you attach your backdrops to as long as you need them to be to fit your space. You just have to find um, a distributor, a supplier in your uh, local area and they'll cut them for you. These aluminium poles are really light, but we also know that when we attach a heavy canvas to them, they're strong enough that they're not going to bow in the middle, which is really important as well. So yeah, um, and then obviously giving them the dimensions of the inside, the, um, <laughs> what's the word? The bit that goes in the inside of the, uh, they're, like, they're a, like a clamp. Almost like a wind on sort of clamp. So yeah. um, once, you, once you get them, even actually when, when you do Google it and um, have a look at it, most of the time they show you the small parts that are involved, but um, you'll be able to contact the supplier and they'll be able to tell you exactly what size pipes you need anyway. The windy um, on bit. As far as colours go, Kelly, so if you are setting up a studio, Yep. Um, uh, what would you recommend as far as go-to colours? So if you're doing a setup like your backdrop stand, for instance, um, what would be the three colours that are a must-have? Oh, for all of this stuff? Uh, oh, for that? Oh, yeah. okay. Do you know, for large canvas backdrops or just a, a seamless roll or something like that, I find a grey is going to be really helpful um, in terms of colour. You can darken it, you can lighten it, depending on how you light it. Really, you know, paper seamlesses, if your budget is tight, you can add beautiful textures. You know, I have so many textures and I add them to all of my backdrops. The thing with um, backdrops for me is I want something light, I want something dark, and I want something in between. So I've got a really light grey, very pale grey, um, which has got some white sort of tones and some warm tones through it that I hand painted myself. And then I've got a really, really dark charcoal grey. So they're my light and my dark. And then my in-between, do you know, it's probably, probably just like a, a, a brownie colour, I suppose, would be a go-to, like a, a more of a neutral tone, like a warm tone, because depending on pe what people wear, uh, that could you know, go really well with a lot of different colours. So, so something that's quite neutral, it seems to be a little bit more flexible in terms of coordinating with different tones. So yeah, I would, if you had to pick three, I'd go with a light, a dark, and then um, yeah, something in the, in the middle. You could go with a lighter, a mid-tone grey if you wanted to, but I always try to have something a little bit more neutral, warm, on hand because something like this even that my my clients um if, depending on what they wear will go really well with it white goes really well with this brown goes really well with it 
And one of, this is actually really similar to the colour I used to have painted on the wall. So I would just use my wall as a backdrop too. Very nice. Um, there are a few questions about other outfits for other members of the family and that sort of thing. So there is one here about um, maternity dresses, how many should I have? And who buys it? Do you buy it or does the client buy it for maternity? Do you know, sometimes your clients, you know, will have beautiful dresses of their own, um, maternity dresses that they haven't necessarily bought for the shoot, but they may have bought them, um, you know, to go, go to a special occasion while they've been pregnant, things like that. So I always ask them if they have something special or a favourite dress to bring it with them. And um, I've obviously got a few things here that I've collected over, over time. Um, but yeah, whites, creams, and I've got a couple of blues there because blue, a lot of men tend to turn up in jeans. <laughs> so it goes really well. Um, but greys obviously work really well. And then for other members of the family, I'm, you know, I don't tend to buy a lot of props, but when I am out and about, if I see a sale, uh, a clothing sale or men's clothing sale or anything like that I will try to stock up on a few bits and pieces just to have on hand because we all know that you know people don't read all the information we give them when it comes to styling so um, having a few spare men's t-shirts on hand works really well um, I've got some uh, grey ones I've got black I've got white and um, uh, I've bought a few collared shirts dressier collared shirts as well so yeah they tend to work work really well. Nice. And um, do you have a wardrobe for siblings? So I do. No, do. siblings, well, well it depends on siblings. the age. I've got a few bits and pieces. Give me a sec. Okay, I'll put the on hold music on. <laughs> the elevator music to keep people entertained. Kelly's just gone up to the very other end of the studio. She's bringing the whole wardrobe down. These are the most gorgeous outfits in the world. So I bought this little rack from Kmart for $20 and the little mini um, hangers that have got all, these are all sort of my older sit of sitter clothes and some of them are a little bit more versatile and they'll go on slightly older children, just even a top or something like that. But yeah, I've got lots of variety. So whenever I'm out and about, if I see something, I'll grab it on sale or I buy them from um, different suppliers, but yeah. I mean, things like this from Handmade Lulu Lu, if I've said that right. Um, you know, they're just absolutely beautiful and a lot of them are quite stretchy, so we'll go on older kids too. But yeah, that sits just off to the side over here. All right, we're nearly done. That table is looking very bare. Do you know, I can fluff as much as, you know, the next person but I do do appreciate that you guys don't want to be there all day. Mega is actually watching you right now and working on her own DIY headphones. Ah perfect. <laughs> all right so a lot of this kind of stuff can go into the drawers Um, and you can pop them obviously into other things, but yeah, you don't have to have everything on display, but it is all about kind of just putting a few bits and pieces up there and creating some texture um, so they can see the different colors and, and ways that you can put different colors and textures together. I wanna put a blanket up on top of that picnic, blank, picnic basket. any underwater photography? That's a random question. No. <laughs> I, I have this funny thing with putting a snorkel on my face. <laughs> um, no, but Rob has. Rob actually went to Tonga um, with a very, very well-known underwater photographer called Darren Jew, and he said it was one of the most incredible experiences he has ever been on. 
So yeah, but do you know who, if you are interested in underwater photography, my best advice is to have a look at the work of Cheryl Walsh. And Cheryl is C-H-E-Y-R-L, I believe. Um, she's a Canson Infinity ambassador. She is, she's truly out of this world. And every shot that she takes is single capture. So I highly recommend going and having a look at her work. It will give you a lot of inspiration if you're into underwater photography. All right, I think I'm almost done. What do you think? And what do you make your V-flats out of, Kelly Brown? My V-flats? Oh, polystyrene. Just, we found a polystyrene factory. And um, yeah, we, we, get, we get that cut to size. And I, um, I can't remember the actual height of them, but they were cut to actually fit the size of my windows. So they're about three, 30 mil. Yeah, they're about three. Three centimetres? Yeah, about three centimetres in thickness. And then we just painted one side black, taped it with black gaff tape. And uh, I can use both, both sides, white or black, white as a reflector and black to sort of help shape light and, and use it as a backdrop. But yeah, Garrett's currently got them up blocking a lot of that natural light coming through here while we do this. So yeah, any more questions? I think I'm almost finished. Um, more things about the waterproof casing. Not obviously an expert on that one, so we won't make comment on that. Yeah, no. <laughs> There's lots of suppliers though that can get it. Um... Canon have some great stuff in terms of um, underwater housing and things like that. Now somebody's asked here, what is under the hanging wraps above the drawers? Oh, here? Oh, I know what you're talking about. These little things? Yeah. They're just little hammocks. So they're from Lemon and Pearl. And I've got three of those and they sit flat. So they go kind of perfectly in here. And um, yeah. And above those is actually all of Kelly's blankets. So they're all on um, coat hangers that are all the same colour, all the same shape. Well, apart from those new ones that ended up straight ones. Yeah. Now I'm just looking for different bits and pieces now to kind of finish this off. Oh, God. What for days? <laughs> Just smile. <laughs> smile and nod. Yes, yes. Everything's fine. <laughs> and how do you usually care for your wraps? Like, what's your, what's your, I suppose, your regime when it comes to, to looking after wraps and that sort of thing? Um, all of my, my wraps and things like that, they get hand washed um, with the sensitive wool wash. And... And then I just, um, I lay them flat to dry over a clothes horse. Not the easiest thing to style here. Little colour. All right. This is all looking very beautiful. Well, I think I'm yeah. done. But that shot there kind of really sums it up. Um, I haven't even as... kind of come around and had a look. Yeah, you kind of got to stand back to look properly, don't you? Yeah. It's a bit like when you're taking a photo, you can kind of get a bit carried away, you know, putting it all together and then you stand up and you get into the right position yep. and uh, you go, yep, no, that's not working. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that doesn't work. 
And then your wraps that you've got off to the side there, Kelly, what kind of, what storagey sort of thing are those? Um, just here? Yeah. So these are just little bamboo um, ladders that I found. I think they cost me about $30. So I just kind of got them hung over the rungs. They're easy so that if I want to move them out of the way, I can. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one I just found in a, in a shop that was closing down, actually. <laughs> I think they had um, jewelry on it. I'm not a fan of that there, so I'm going to take it away. All right. So yeah, it doesn't look too cluttered. It looks nice and neat. All the textures and colors are on display and I've kind of gone from my warm tones into sort of some cooler tones um, and some sort of softer pastels down there. I can keep playing, but um, I think that's all you guys need to see really. But it's, I like to do this probably once a month because it just gets you back in here. It gets you sort of more familiar with some of the items that you might not have used. I don't know about you, but I often will put things in a special space and forget about it. And then I'll go to find it and I can't find it. So it does help with finding things that you have put away previously. <laughs> but the beautiful thing about having drawers and stuff like this is, is that some of these things that you know you don't use all the time, you can just pop into those drawers and hide them away. But this does give people that little bit of a kind of a wow factor when they walk in to kind of go, oh, look at all the beautiful things and give them some ideas of, of how you know, their shoot's going to potentially go, but yeah. And I suppose now that you've gone through and um, made this all beautiful, that there, I suppose, is something to put on your socials. Absolutely. So when we talked about creating content to share on social media, take photographs of this, put it on your blog, write a blog about, you know, the, um, the different materials or how you care for your different items. So it gives people a little bit more confidence in what it is that, you know, um, they're going to use but it's about now creating I suppose the excitement for when we get through this and giving people a reason to contact you when they're allowed to you know to go out and be photographed and things like that and getting as much content out there as you possibly can and every day you should be sharing content on your page not just to interact with your clients but so that the social media algorithms know that you are active when you are not active, they don't think that you are necessary or should be shown to your followers. So make sure that you are still being active with your social media platforms if you want to create organic reach. And that is going to be very, very important for you in terms of reaching um, you know, a, a, a new potential client. But we talked about that the other day. We did. Lots of videos, I have shared them all. Please go through the video section, go through the announcement sections. The beautiful things about you know going back over them is that you can fast forward different bits and pieces and um, take notes, write things down because um, you know we don't know obviously how long we are going to be in lockdown, but use this time and, and work on your business, create that routine, go through the, um, the blog, the newbornposing.com blog. There is so much content on there that could give you ideas, inspiration and, and motivation as well. So yeah, I'm gonna go, Just I think. Just about every question that was asked here today is in a blog. Oh yeah, like absolutely. That, there's that much content. So this was open slather for anyone to ask any question that they wanted to. And there's pretty much a blog post on every single topic. So yeah. do go and have a look at that. Um, but for those of you who didn't catch the beginning of this, uh, once the live does end, you'll be able to go back. And, and if watch someone it has put an angry face on there, I can see it. Good Lord, people. You know, you don't need to be in the group. You don't need to watch, but be nice. I think that's Hopefully what we all need accident. right now. Hopefully it was an accident, but that's not on. You know, I've been in here live every day with Garrett giving away a lot of information, a lot of content. You know what, if you don't like it, keep scrolling. Just be kind, please, to each other, to everyone. When you comment on a post, it doesn't matter whether it's in this group or in another group, just always treat people the same way that you would like to be treated. And I think that's what we need right now um, as a society, as a community. So yeah, look after each other, stay safe, stay home, stay motivated, stay inspired, and I will see you tomorrow. We're gonna have a little bit more fun here in the, the studio. Um, I think.
actually can't remember what we're doing tomorrow. But anyway. I don't even know what day tomorrow is. Yep. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. It'll it's be, a day. It'll be entertaining anyway. Always. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go. Bye. Take care, guys. Bye.